Hello everyone and welcome to our Applying Ethology webinars. Today we have Beth Ventura from the University of Minnesota where she is an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Animal Science. Beth is specifically interested in how attitudes toward animals affect human behavior and animal welfare in general. She also has applied research interests mostly in pain mitigation for routine procedures and environmental enrichment. If you want to have an in-depth read on the topic and have a look on the book chapter she recently published in Changing Human Behavior to Enhance Animal Welfare, which was edited by Rebecca Somerville. So Beth, it is a pleasure to have you with us and so looking forward to your talk. Thank you uh, everyone and thanks for having me. Can I just do a like sound check just to confirm that it's not just Laura who can hear me. Can I do like, a, like an emoji thumbs up or anything just to make sure? It, oh, perfect. At least one person. Thank you. Okay. So at least, okay, cool. Awesome. That's always what I'm paranoid about. So um, there's, I've been having some very minor technical issues with my headset lately. So if for some reason you stop hearing me, let me know. <laughs> so, cause I'm not very good at the miming situation. So um, thanks again for, for having me, everyone. Um, this talk uh, is uh kind of some thoughts that have uh, I've been gathering with a couple of uh, colleagues over the last year or two, uh, thinking about how we can more effectively communicate about animal welfare, not just um, amongst each other, but also amongst uh, and to very diverse stakeholders, especially the public. Um, and so I've got this, you know, shouty guy here. Uh, and the spoiler alert is that the, the shouting is not what I would consider to be the recommended approach toward uh, communication about animal welfare. Uh, so before I really get into what we're talking about today, I'd just like to uh, do some thank yous and acknowledgements instead of shoving them at the very back of my talk. Um, and so first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge um, my amazing co-author uh, of, of this book chapter. And this talk is basically drawn from this book chapter that Erica uh, and I wrote together um, titled, uh, from stakeholder engagement to, or excuse me, from stakeholder in education to engagement using strategies from social science. And so even though I'm the one delivering this talk, really the ideas within it are hers, uh, certainly as much as mine. Um, and secondly, I'd like to recognize our editor for this book, um, Rebecca Somerville. Uh, so this, uh, she's the one who gave us the chance to really put our ideas down on paper. Um, and this book is entitled Changing Human Behavior to Enhance Animal Welfare, and that will be coming out next year, hint, hint. Um, and then finally, I'd also like to credit two of my uh, colleagues uh, who are also alumni from the uh, Animal Welfare Program at UBC, uh, where we did our PhD work together, um, and that's Katie Proudfoot and Jesse Robbins. Um, they've both been really instrumental in helping develop some of the ideas uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, Katie also provided some uh, feedback on our book chapter, so I want to recognize both Jesse and Katie uh, for, for helping kind of develop some of these ideas. So, um, in terms of the map uh, for this talk, I, I first want to set the stage a little bit for why I think it's important to spend some time uh, as animal welfare professionals sorting through why communication about our field can be so tricky, um, especially when we're trying to communicate with the public and other diverse audiences. Um, and the reasons uh, why it can be so tricky, I think, is because we have lots of barriers uh, that we have to reckon with uh, to more effectively engage with people. And so I'm going to actually be spending a lot of time today walking through some of those barriers because I think um, before we can ever actually start to figure out what to do, it's really important to, to recognize some of the pitfalls that we often stumble into. Uh, and so I'm going to touch briefly on some challenges related to what the public knows uh, and maybe what they don't know about animal welfare before playing around with uh, some of the cognitive biases that we all hold. Uh, and then I'm gonna spend some time uh, in, with some self-reflection maybe, some of the issues that we as experts um, or practitioners in welfare have to reckon, uh, reckon with within ourselves. 
and then I'll move on to kind of how we can start to rethink some of um, the, the gap between uh, so-called experts in animal welfare and non-experts or the public. Uh, and then I'll conclude with uh, some ways to move forward and offer some ideas that we have about how we could better approach uh, animal welfare communication. <clears throat> so um, I want to start, I guess, by by acknowledging how complicated our work is. Um, animal welfare in the field of it is so complicated. Um, our science is complex, how we measure it, the aspects that we focus on, how we define it. What people think about it is complex too. Um, and I think that's partially a reflection of the fact that our science, animal welfare science itself is so multidimensional, so interdisciplinary. We've got physiologists and anatomy and we have behaviorists, ethologists, we have nutritionists, cognition scientists and so on. Um, and the other aspect of this complexity, I think, is that animal welfare is a mandated science, meaning that um, our field arose out of ethical and societal concern about what constitutes proper care, or proper welfare for animals. And I think that provides us uh, with a, a really messy field that we work in. And I love that messiness um, in all its complexity, its contradictions, um, and the opportunities I think it provides, if we're going to be positive about it, um, the opportunities that maybe we all have for conflict resolution uh, related to some of the differing views that people hold around animal welfare. Um, because as I'm sure each, each and all of each and every one of us knows and, and is deeply uh, experienced in, um, the people uh, that we work with, um, the people that we communicate with, that we interface with, um, differ from us in what they think animal welfare is and should be. Um, we differ in our values about animal welfare and our opinions um, about it. Um, and we see this I think manifest in the literature on the subject um, and on the range of definitions um, that the different scientists have put forth to, to conceptualize once and for all what exactly is animal welfare. Um, and so for me, what makes what helps me make sense of, of some of the literature in this um, in this complexity and messiness is um, uh, David Frazier and colleagues three welfare or three spheres model for animal welfare framework. Um, so I know a lot of us maybe right now might already be familiar with that framework. Uh, but for anyone who's not or if it's new, I'm just going to take a moment to uh, walk through this. Uh, and that's basically that um, David and uh, Frazier and colleagues have put forth this idea that, you know, people think about animal welfare and value it in different ways. So, for example, you might be someone um, who is a veterinarian who, for you, animal welfare really focuses and comes down to how an animal's body is functioning on a day-to-day -day basis and long term. So, everything to do with its health status, its disease status, if it's receiving good nutrition, um, if its body condition is, is adequate, if it's free from injury, if it's clean, uh, if it's, you know, if we're experiencing low or high mortality rates, uh, how well the animal's performing or producing. Um, but uh, alternatively, someone else may think that that's important, but what they're really, really concerned with is more to do with what the animal's mind um, is experiencing and what their emotional state is their, or their affective state. So, so really, what, uh, whether they're free from negative states such as pain or fear or frustration um, or boredom and whether they're able to also experience positive aff um, affective um, states like uh, comfort or um, satiation or pleasure. Um, and then kind of thirdly, um, there's also maybe uh, people who may think that those are important, but what they're really primarily concerned with might be more to do with the natural living situation of an animal, both in terms of the environment in, with it, in which it's housed in, whether it's, you know, outside and the, the on the grass and there's, you know, wind blowing through their hair, um, or alternatively, you know, what kind of behavioral expression they have the opportunity to engage in. Are they able to, to do motivated behaviors? Are they housed in socially um, uh, natural dynamics, basically? So um, 
I really like to use this framework. It's, it's helped me a lot throughout the years kind of sort through and organize how different people think about animal welfare. And, it, and I think that's, it's very important to understanding how we can start to approach communicating about it. Um, yeah, so um, considering kind of this framework, I think it can be challenging um, for us to try to aim for a consensus on one right, correct understanding of animal welfare. I don't, I don't know if that's possible. It might be possible. Um, if it is, I'm excusing myself, I guess, from that conversation today. But I think my point is that, um, and our point actually, not just mine, <laughs> um, Erica and Mai's point is that if we recognize and name the complexity and diversity in which different people might interpret animal welfare, I think we can communicate a little bit more effectively um, to other stakeholders and even within our own stakeholder group. And when I say stakeholders, what I'm kind of talking about is, is anyone who has a stake or an interest in the welfare of animals. So certainly everyone in this uh, webinar today is, is absolutely a stakeholder. You're probably um, in some capacity, some sort of animal practitioner. Uh, you work with animals or your work uh, affects animals in some way. Uh, maybe you're a veterinarian, maybe you're a farmer, maybe you're an ethologist or an animal welfare scientist. Maybe you're a zookeeper or a behavior consultant, a trainer, a welfare advocate, uh, you work in policy, et cetera, et cetera. So off, basically you hold this role and this role, it, you can kind of, you know, put your expert hat on. Um, you often take up the role as expert. And so I'll kind of intermittently throughout the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm talking about you, I'm talking about us. Uh, we, be, we have become experts to, to one degree or another in our field uh, and we've, we've become you know, seen as experts in animal welfare. Um, but I don't think we're the only important stakeholders um, in conversations about animal welfare. I'd also argue uh, that the public is a critical stakeholder in this conversation about how we improve animal welfare for, for many reasons. Um, they function as customers, as consumers, um, as, as our clients, but even if they're none of those things, they're still um, contributing to a consensus in society about how animals um, should be raised uh, and how we, how we need to interact with them. And our challenge, I think, is that um, you know, when, so when I started in animal welfare, um, I, I wasn't really thinking too much about working with people. I wanted to work with animals, but it turns out that if you work with animals, you also are inevitably working with people and you have to interact with them whether you want to or not. Some, some people I think less so than others want to do that. But I think that the nature of our work as animal welfare experts in some capacity, much of our work means that we need to interface frequently with, with members of the public. Uh, partially, or maybe wholly because uh, I think collectively we're aiming to bridge that gap between, you know, what, what identification of what best practice is uh, for animal welfare and, and actually getting it implemented. And that means trying to change uh, the knowledge, the attitudes, the behavior of people who use and impact animals. Uh, the public. Um, and I'll, I, I just want to kind of clarify that this, I've, I've kind of created a false distinction between experts versus public. Of course, this is arbitrary. We are all also members of the public. Um, and I'll touch on a little later. Uh, it's not that we, even though we have our expert hats on, we are not always, of course, the torch bearers of all that is right and good and correct when it comes to animal welfare. Um, so let's turn a little bit to some of those challenges that we, the potential torch bearers, face when we attempt to connect with the public. Uh, and when I bring this topic up to other animal practitioners, often the first topic that comes, uh, comes up uh, when I speak to others, when I speak to farmers or veterinarians or scientists, um, is kind of the lamentation that the public is very ignorant about animals, about animal welfare. You know, they don't understand how farm animals are raised or they don't know how to train their dogs appropriately, et cetera. I, I complain about that. You probably complain about that. It's this normal. <laughs> um, but what's actually quite tricky and this is something that's been challenging for me to reconcile with, uh, is that if we're actually looking into the science of what we know uh, about how to form communication 
and how to actually understand who we're trying to communicate to. When we look into what people know about animal welfare, there's actually a whole, like the, the the literature on this is pretty scant, um, uh, uh, specifically um, with you know what people know about farm animals, for example, and, and farming. Um, and what we do know suggests that this knowledge is actually pretty complicated, and it makes it's very difficult to bring or to make large generalizations. Um, so we have to be quite specific, I think. Um, so, for example. What we do know and, and the information that is out there does suggest that large portions of the public don't know too much about certain animal welfare issues, uh, for example, in farming. So the Eurobarometer surveys, for example, uh, over the past um, 10, 15 years, uh, when they ask you know, tens of thousands of, of citizens in, in different uh, European Union countries. Uh, what do they know about the conditions in which farm animals are raised, for example? Uh, most claim little to no knowledge in these, in these areas, but they want to know more. Uh, they just don't have that knowledge. Um, uh, but if you, one thing that's important to note about some of this, uh, and I'm, I'm just doing very broad strokes right now, is that the knowledge that people do have varies a lot. And it varies by lots of different factors, lots of different demographics. So, um, excuse me, knowledge in some countries is much higher than in others. Um, knowledge according to, you know, education level and income level um, and, and species, specific species of interest is, is, is again, very um, diverse. So again, it makes it hard to draw large, um, broad conclusions. Um, and the other thing that's tricky about this is that, most of the literature that we do have on it, on, on what people know about, say, farm animal welfare, it's, um, it relies on self-reported knowledge. Like if you're asking a question of how much do you know, people might say a lot, a little, or nothing at all. Instead of actually, you know, querying them on the specifics of, you know, how are dairy cows raised or what are, what, you know, what age do we slaughter broiler chickens or whatever it is. So we don't have a whole lot of that type of information. Um, there is a little bit and it's not promising about what people know, but, but we don't actually have very much. I think I've said that about five times now. <laughs> Um, and a similar story kind of appears with respect to knowledge, the public's knowledge about other species. So, for example, um, we are probably pretty concerned about low or poor knowledge of um, owners of, of, of dogs and cats and other pets. Uh, so uh, recently, a uh, um, kind of an expert consultation um, uh, in the UK identified that poor or low owner knowledge about uh, just basic behavior and health information for pets uh, seems to be a pretty top animal welfare priority in the United Kingdom. And if you turn to um, North America, there's, there's similar surveys that have documented um, either variable or, or low um, knowledge of managing behavior issues um, for owners, for their dogs and their cats. Um, uh, though, and uh, again, though, that, that, that um, knowledge is a little bit variable. So those who, who have, uh, there are people that report advanced training knowledge and everything, and they report fewer behavior problems. But um, again, it's a little bit variable. And so my, my point here, I think, is that the reports that we do have suggest it, it may be that public knowledge is quite low. Of course, anecdotally, we've all experienced this when we interact with people, our clients, that, that we have a, a gap to, to, to bridge. Um, and, that and this poor knowledge can, of course, be a, a significant barrier uh, to communicating, um, both because it fuels frustration maybe on, on the expert side, uh, but it also can potentially feel dissonance and conflict between ourselves and, and the public uh, with regards to our animal welfare goals. But I do want to uh, cautious us, or caution us, cautious, um, that's weird, um, <laughs> caution us against maybe um, going into an interaction with, with someone um, and, and just uh, assuming already that they're ignorant about it, or alternatively viewing public low knowledge as inherently a negative thing. Um, perhaps it is instead an opportunity. Um, and then compounding this challenge of um, 
limited or potential limited public knowledge about animal welfare, I think is the reality of um, cognitive biases and, and how many cognitive biases uh, people are challenged by. Um, and so this, this is a kind of a laundry list, um, a scrolling through the Wikipedia site of the, you know, over 100 cognitive biases uh, that people, uh, that have been documented in people. But essentially, we have to reckon with the, I, the reality that not just in the public, but in all of us, um, other experts, other stakeholders, and even in ourselves, that we are challenged by our own preconceived ideas about how animals live, how they learn, how they handle challenges. Um, and we all process information about these things differently. Um, and if we don't recognize that these types of percept perceptual barriers um, or ways of processing information or filtering information exist, um, we are, I think, going to be challenged in effectively communicating. And it's, it's not that cognitive biases are, are inherently negative. They certainly are not. I mean, like, there's a reason we have them. They're very useful in helping us process large amounts of information in a rapid and efficient way. Um, but we still have to potentially acknowledge that they're going to challenge us when it comes to trying to change behavior to improve animal welfare. Um, and so I'm going to just kind of walk through an example of how potentially cognitive biases could um, uh, play out to the detriment of animal welfare. And so I'm going to use an example uh, of dog training. So, so early on, we know that our, our earlier studies of, of captive wolves were kind of long used as the baseline for, for how people thought of social behavior in dogs and, and how dominance relationships played out. Um, we know now that like the, our understanding based on those early studies of captive wolves is, is a flawed uh, way to think of it, um, both because we've applied more rigorous ethological um, approaches to understanding both the behavior of wolves as well as dogs. Um, but what's happened also we've seen um, is that some trainers, um, dog trainers or animal trainers, prominent or otherwise, are still kind of influenced by some outdated theories. And maybe they'll advise dog owners to, you know, take charge as pack leaders. Um, and that might include the, inclu uh, that might necessitate, or sorry, that might include certain aversive training methods uh, that, you know, in which dogs are flooded with fearful situations. Um, uh, you know, they can, we can generate avoidance and fear and pain and aggression in our dogs, and we can certainly harm the, the human and animal bond. So that's not great uh, for welfare uh, for anybody. Um, but if, if that thinking and those theories are someone's first introduction to dog training, um, that might likely become what's called their anchoring bias, which is basically the tendency to rely too much on whatever the first information is that you learn about a particular topic. And then following that, what may happen is that con confirmation biases will prompt someone's inclination to seek out additional sources that support that outdated thinking. Uh, so that they'll start to favor and filter information and, and, and put e extra emphasis on information that confirms what they already believe about, in this case, dog training. Um, and then because the mind, the human mind kind of favors simplifications or mental shortcuts, which broadly would be known as heuristics. Um, so then the, this particular person may then start to fall for shortcuts to uh, in training that, that follow these uh, modalities in order to achieve what they're hoping to do uh, in terms of training their dog. Um, and then there's, there's tons and tons of other cognitive biases that, of course, might play out and hinder us um, uh, in this regard. Um, something else that becomes challenging is, is the general tendency to anthropomorphize animals uh, or, or attribute human-like characteristics to them. So uh, in the, with dogs, you know, we like to try to hug our dogs, even though dogs, most of them don't want to be hugged, but we're like, oh, it's a, it's a human thing that this is how we express affection. But from the dog standpoint, not so much. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, that's all I want to say about that. Um, and then what I now I'm going to abruptly shift gears. <laughs> um, and 
and kind of acknowledge, okay, so we're playing around and we're, reckon we're reckoning with some of these cognitive biases, both in others as well as ourselves. But now I wanna turn the focus purely to kind of ourselves, the experts, so-called, um, because there's a lot of issues that we need to reckon, reckon with as well. And I think the first is actually something that is largely positive. <laughs> and that is that we tend um, in our training uh, to, to, to be trained in the language of science, of facts. Um, we're trained to rely on science as the most effective and the desirable basis from which to improve practice, uh, improve animal welfare, and ultimately maybe implement change. Um, that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> I, I cannot emphasize enough, obviously, how important it is that that is so, um, especially maybe today in, in the post-fact world. It's really scary that, it, yeah, anyway, uh, we don't have to talk too much about that. Um, suffice to say that, you know, experts' worldviews resting on scientific, scientific foundations, I think that's essential. That should not change. But, the impulse sometimes then is to assume that the science then should become the only language in which we should communicate about issues that require change. And I think that becomes a problem or at least a challenge because um, much of the public has not received this, this training. Um, uh, you know, we're privileged with a lot of this training and we're finding ourselves having to communicate with people who are operating maybe on different wavelengths. Um, and it becomes very difficult for us if we're trying to communicate with, with other groups um, to cross some of those gaps without the help of an additional language. And so I think that, that we as animal experts, animal practitioners, animal welfare scientists, et cetera, I think we'll benefit if we start to learn some new languages. And I think that's really important because science has, our science in, science in general has long, you know, it, it is political, it is, um, you know, it exists in a social structure. I know that we could have debates about whether science is political or not, but um, in animal welfare, it certainly is. Um, our field exemplifies this, um, you know, we had the animal welfare has ethical ramifications it has legal ramifications political social ramifications it's inherently interdisciplinary and because of that i think it ref this reflects a need for us as its practitioners to be versed in languages that help will help us better navigate the complexity that interdisciplinary nature of our science um but the challenge is that um, historically, certainly, I think it's changing now, and it's, there's a lot of amazing efforts that, that, that indicate that that is changing, but historically, and certainly uh, in a lot of other areas today, many in the veterinary communities, the animal science communities, we've traditionally lacked formal training in, you know, psychology, sociology, communication, um, and such training, even in something as simple as, as learning some of the, the theories of behavior change, of risk communication, um, something I rely on a lot, and something that, that the animal welfare science literature relies on a lot is uh, the theory of uh, planned behavior, uh, for example. Um, this type of training, this type of knowledge, I think would, would help ensure that we better understand how people arrive at decisions. And without it, I think um, our communication efforts might be ineffectual, uh, especially if it rests on outdated assumptions about how people process information. Uh, and so I want to just spend a, a moment with, uh, with this little guy, um, something known as the knowledge or the information deficit model. Uh, it's really common for us um, and for, for those working with animals and realistically any expert uh, to ascribe ignorance on behalf of the public. Um, it's a, a key assumption of kind of this uh, assumption, this model is that when we, the experts, make our recommendations or when we defend our practices or otherwise kind of hinge our communication based on science, we then um, maybe get upset or concerned if the public doesn't accept what, what we're telling them. Um, and we believe that the reason that they don't accept it is because they don't understand the science. They don't understand the reality of the situation. And so the corollary kind of of this model assumes that um, if people are concerned about an animal welfare topic, um, it's because that they don't get it and we need to correct that. And so the approach then for us often is then, well, we're gonna come up and we're gonna inform them. We're gonna, we're gonna educate the ignorance out of them. Um, we, we have documentation that, that we, we do this. Um, we know that farmers do it. We know that veterinarians do that. 
I do this all the time and I could check myself all the time. You probably do it. We all do this. It's, it's not, you know, terrible that we do it, but um, we're probably shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit by doing this. Um, so the question then uh, that we need to ask is, are our own beliefs about public ignorance fully justified? Yes, yes they are often, but it's not that simple. Um, yes, because there is still a lot of information deficit that we do have to correct, it is still important to ensure that we are continuing to information share, information grounded in science. But I think that we can stand to improve the value and the impact of what we're communicating if we can also start to rethink how we other the public. Um, because if we continue to other, other people who we're trying to communicate with, we may limit or even prohibit meaningful engagement. Um, especially because if we, if, we friend, if we frame our communication in assumption, automatic assumptions of ignorance, um, we're going to fail. And the reason that we're going to fail, I think, is threefold. One, because this model, this assumption, this way of thinking fails to recognize that people evaluate issues and they make decisions not just on the basis of information, but also as an accumulation of, you know, their, their, their past, their families, their social groups, their cultural backgrounds, um, the economic reality of the situation. And critically, people may disagree with or reject what we say because it doesn't, what we're saying doesn't align or maybe even conflicts with their core values about animal welfare. Um, and so I think if we acknowledge that and we really recognize that and sit with that, um, that might help us a little bit. Um, the second issue is um, often when we introduce information and if that information conflicts with those values, we may find um, ourselves, we, we may find people clinging more firmly to their original belief instead of bringing them more over to where we were hoping to bring them. Um, and so this is something broadly that's described as the backfire effect. And, and while actually the backfire effect as a psychological phenomenon has been kind of called into question a little bit, um, there's some interesting um, ways in which uh, specific to our discipline, animal welfare science and animal welfare issues, it may, may actually still play out. Um, yeah, because um, we do know that increasing information provision about some animal welfare topic or some animal topics like farming, um, we can actually activate concern instead of decrease concern. Um, and so we have to keep in mind that regardless of how we're sharing information or what information we're sharing, um, the people that we're trying to information share with are trying to find ways to simplify their thinking. Um, and that's going to maybe have unintended consequences for us if the goal, if our goal is solely to educate the public. And then kind of finally, um, we might have, we might be challenged by information sharing simply because people respond differently to the same information because they are different. I mean, that sounds really obvious, but I don't think we think about that enough. Like our audience, like the, the public is not a monolith. I refer to them as the public, but they're incredibly diverse just like any other group is. Um, and it becomes very challenging to, to reconcile that. Um, and so I'm going to, to walk through an example of, of how we observe segmentation in response to receiving information about animal welfare. Um, so there's, there's research on this, but I actually, because I teach a lot, um, and I teach a lot, a lot of types of students, undergraduate students, um, I love to use this example because I find it super interesting. Hopefully you find it interesting as well. Um, but basically, I teach, I teach a very large online class uh, in animals and society broadly. And, and the students I have, I have hundreds of students in this class every year. Uh, every week we spend on a different kind of animal industry or topic. So for example, one week we spend a week learning about um, everything to do with, with poultry production um, and especially egg production and layer hens. Um, and so we spend this week uh, together 
um, all kind of processing and learning and going through the same information in detail on um, different types of, of egg rearing systems, both cage and cage free and free range systems. We look at impacts on animal welfare, on worker health and safety, on sustainability and, and environmental outcomes. The students go on a, a scavenger hunt to analyze uh, egg labels in their grocery store and figure out what labels mean and what they don't mean. And at the end of this week, I ask them how, if any, anyway, that they might approach their egg purchasing behavior in the future. Uh, would they change the types of eggs that they seek out? And what's fascinating to me is that year after year, students diverge in their decisions. And it's, it's almost neatly like a third go here, a third go here, a third go here. And I think this underscores how, how clearly individuals differently interpret the same exact information. So for example, I have a number of students who say something like this, this specific student did, um, that I would change my behavior and I'd move toward cage free um, because it appears that these hens undergo less physical uh, musculoskeletal trauma as a result of more space to move about, to exercise, as well as um, they have the opportunity to perform more you know, normal or natural bird behaviors. So if we think back to kind of that three spheres model of animal welfare values, um, it seems like for this student, you know, they're thinking a little bit about, you know, natural living uh, in terms of this normal bird behavior, maybe also some, some, you know, biological functioning issues as well. In contrast, we have this person and, and students like this person who say, you know, after learning about the adverse effects of cage free systems, I may be reaching for the cages, the furnace cages that have a perch and a uh, dust bath the next time I buy. I had no idea that cage free didn't automatically mean happier or healthier animals. So maybe this person is really drawing on some of their, their deeper held values for biological functioning for effective state. And then finally, I mean, there's also students who don't, who don't care. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm not going to change because this is not this, you know, these labels don't really mean much to me. The information is not life changing. I mean, that's not something you want to hear as the instructor, but, you know, you just got to accept it. <laughs> um, so, so for this person, I usually consume the, the cheapest eggs that I can find. So, so others are indifferent or maybe motivated by economic constraints. And so, this segmentation, I think, is really um, likely uh, to have profound consequences for any of our efforts if, if we're trying to influence public behavior in some way. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind. All right, um, so I just have a couple of more slides before I, um, before I conclude today. Um, so I think given all of these challenges, I think our de desired outcome probably for most of us is that we want a little bit closer alignment between ourselves and, and people we're trying to communicate with. And I think that's gonna entail compromise or it's gonna necessitate compromise. Um, and in order to do this, I think we need to do a couple of things. We need to recognize first that um, there are shared values that, that exist between ourselves and who we're trying to communicate with, but we may have to work a little bit hard to, to kind of to, to ferret out maybe where those uh, exist. And I think it's also really important for us to think of, uh, re reimagine kind of this us versus them dichotomy. Um, partially because when we actually look into the literature and, and where people sit with different welfare values, we do see a lot of overlap. So even though the specifics maybe in terms of, you know, what someone specifically thinks about, you know, one husbandry practice or one training um, approach or something like that, those might differ a little bit. But if we look deeper, there may be still some common values that are shared. And I think those are good foundations to start with when we think about approaching communication. And so I'd like to kind of end today uh, with some recommendations um, that, that Erica and I came up with for how to approach uh, communication. Um, do I still have some time? I'm hearing some feedback. Maybe we're still okay. You still have time, Beth. Oh, cool. All right. That's good. Um, all right. So, so I've got, we've got four recommendations um, to end with. Um, and the first is actually, because um, I can't help it, and I am a, a professor and a teacher in addition to, you know, other things, uh, I'm going to give you some homework. <laughs> um, and that is that... Um, because so many of us, I think, lack 
formal uh, communication training. Um, I encourage us as individuals to pursue um, some more some more knowledge in this area uh, to maybe per take opportunities to 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 go to communication trainings. Um, dive into the literature on what we know so far about what people's attitudes are um, toward animal welfare, uh, uh, public acceptance or rejection of science, um, theories of behavior change, that sort of thing. I would also encourage those who have any power over curriculum planning or training for you know, future animal professionals to consider implementing modules or coursework on these subjects and consider them as a core part of, of training um, you know, animal welfare's practitioners um, so that they're better situated to meet the demands of, of this kind of really complicated field that we find ourselves in. Um, I think in general, uh, I, I'm, I love the field of animal welfare science and I want, to, I want it to be stronger and more robust. And I think uh, to do so, it, 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 it's going to in, uh, require a little bit more of an interdisciplinary and collaborative approach for all of its practitioners. Um, secondly, uh, I, will in, I encourage us to, to practice something that I've, um, I've named adaptive transparency. Uh, and, and what that basically is, um, is uh, information sharing, the hows and the whys behind what we do, um, what our recommendations are. Um, hold on for two seconds, I'm hearing some feedback. Laura, can you mute? Um, yeah, I just did. Beauty, thank you, sorry. I'm very easily distracted. <laughs> Uh, it works well when I'm teaching. Not at all. Okay. Anyway, so re revisiting back. Okay. So this idea of adaptive transparency. So yes, continue to information share why and how you do things. What, like what your recommendations are, what the practices are that you do. So I think that, that's the transparency part, but, but then also, and, and maybe more importantly, be prepared to really listen and respond and even maybe modify your practice a little bit based on how public responds to receiving information. So I encourage us to, to, you know, when we're having a conversation with our client or our customer or whatever it is, our, our person who we're trying to talk to, um, ask more questions. Like, what does good animal welfare look like to you? Um, can you share the reasons behind your belief in this particular practice or issue? And then um, listen to the responses that emerge with the intent to truly understand without interrupting, without interjecting, um, and then summarize it back to the speaker as part of, um, uh, it, to make sure that you've gotten what they, what, that you understood what they've actually said. And this is something called reflective listening. Um, and I also encourage us to engage in something called frame reflection, such that you place yourself mentally in the position of the other person, interrogate how you would believe or think or feel in that position. And we know, how is somebody drawing over my slides? That's very interesting. <laughs> um, in any case, um, I don't know if you can see that, but I can. Um, okay, so frame reflection. So something that's really cool about this technique is that we have some, some data um, that it has been shown to increase someone's capacity to learn within a different perspective about animals. We can also, we also find that um, we've been able to improve practitioner belief in the legitimacy of other perspectives. And what that does is really critical. It sets the stage for a um, more non-judgmental uh, non space to have an open dialogue where people feel empowered to share why they're doing the things that they do. Um, and I think that construction of such space is key if we are supposed, if we're going to be able to build a better relationship between ourselves and the public. Um, and as a, I think a nice bonus, if we do that, we're actually going to make people more likely to listen to us and actually apply the recommendations that we, that we have. Um, thirdly, um, I think it's, helpful for us to keep in mind. I don't know about you, but I'm a perfectionist. Um, and something that I've had to reconcile with in myself is that perfection is the enemy of the good. Um, and this is more of a personal thought, but it's just an idea that we've had. Um, but I think we would do well to acknowledge that the complexity of our field implies that sometimes when we try to improve welfare in one area, we might hinder it or, or pause it in another area. And while the one welfare framework is a 
like I love this framework. It's it's awesome, um, and then we and we can use that framework to to implement change and make improvements. I think there's always still going to continue to be some compromise and in, in, inherent in some of our efforts. Um, I think if we're able to do this and we're prepared to acknowledge at least the, the need to compromise in our communication and our goals sometimes, I know that might be contentious, but I think what it will do is one, improve the chances that the, the ways in which we work with diverse stakeholders who maybe don't look exactly like us or think exactly like us, I think they'll ma that'll make us more successful in the long run. But I also think it's going to help um, bolster our own resilience um, and our energy and our, our hearts and our mental health when it, when it sometimes takes more time or effort to achieve whatever our goals are with respect to improving animal welfare. And then finally, um, I'd like to kind of leave us with the thought that, you know, this field that we that we're in this magical, complicated, messy field is continuously evolving. And so I think for us as its practitioners, we must continue to also practice and cultivate um, the openness to learning new things within our field, especially. Um, and um, the fact that, you know, we don't have all the answers yet in a lot of a lot of these issues. Um, we're still exploring them, we're still figuring them out. And then the ethics come into play and compound this even further. And I think that underscores how important it is for us to be able in our communication to acknowledge the limits of our own knowledge and keep learning, keep learning about new ways of approaching welfare. Um, also because listening and engaging with the public may in and of itself be valuable for us in achieving whatever our goals are for animal welfare. Maybe it introduces new ways of thinking or cultivates, um, you know, uh, gives us new knowledge about how to tackle an issue. Um, so I think that might make our communication efforts a little more complicated sometimes. It's not super black and white. It's not incredibly, you know, like here's do this one, two, three thing and you're done. Um, so it's, I've made your life maybe more complicated, but hopefully um, also this, this type of approach will ultimately make our communication efforts um, more effective and ultimately more valuable in achieving progress for animal welfare. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention and your time today, and I welcome a conversation uh, if anybody has questions or would like to share their thoughts. Thank you. Beth, thank you so much for sharing, sharing your work and just being so enthusiastic about animal welfare and yes, the challenges we have, but also the great opportunities. Um, for everybody, Please, if you have questions, type them in the chat box and we'll get to them. I have a question to get us started. If using education as a tool comes across as demeaning, what do you envision is the best way to translate science? You mentioned information share. Are you envisioning this as a new form of education? Oh my God, that's a lot of, that, first of all, that's an amazing multi-step question. Can you give me the first part of that question first and then um, I'll share my perspective, but I'd also welcome if any, anyone else has thoughts, you know, this is, this is not just me, you know, it's every, we all have really, I think, good ideas to uh, curate here. So can you, but first, can you fix, give me the first part of that again? What do you envision is the best way to translate science? Oh God, what do I envision is the best way to translate science? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, it will depend on who you're trying to translate science to. So maybe I, I think if it were me, I'd first, before I start sharing what I'm talking about, I might first ask some questions. So I might ask questions of the audience or I might have, you know, ask people, how, what do you think when it, so I do this with my students um, when I when I, when it, we start an animal welfare class or an animal behavior class I first ask my students uh, you know what what do you know about animal welfare what does it mean to you how would you define it and then we map together kind of where the class or where the group is at and and I think doing that has helped me a lot to to figure out um, and target exactly what 
where, where the audience is at, first of all. So I'm not either flying direct, like super over their heads or, or really, you know, hitting super basics that they've already covered. So I'm, I'm kind of meeting them first at their level. Um, that also is then giving me the understanding of maybe what people believe and what's important to them. Um, and then from, so, so I would do that. And then you can maybe structure and target the, because you've maybe pre-identified like here are the the learning objectives <laughs> that I have. So I'm honestly like I uh, teaching teaching classes about about these topics has been really helpful for for framing uh, how to approach science communication uh, because I've I've screwed up a lot, <laughs> um, but but the the messing up is is partial to the job because you figure out what works are uh, important for the job because you figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, and then, so when it comes back to communicate it, so one other thing is, is don't be, uh, don't drone on and be redundant, which is what I'm doing right now. Uh, so don't do that. <laughs> um, prepare first, <laughs> um, and identify maybe some specific and limited learning objectives. Um, because what the other thing you want to avoid is overload. Um, so identify, you know, two or three things that are what you consider to be the most important pieces of information to share. And then once you do that, follow up, see how that resonated. See, see if you would cheat, like if, if they understood what you, what you're communicating and see if they have any concerns about it. So, so it's like information communication, I think is two ways. You, sh you, you share what you think is important, but then you listen to see how that works. So creating a dialogue. Very cool. Uh, so there's quite a few questions coming in. So this one's from Birta. Excellent talk, Beth. In the artificial division between animal practitioners and the public, where do politicians and regulators fit? Oh, um, they're maybe their own bubble, but also both. So, I mean, like, having not been someone who personally has uh, interacted with tons of politicians and regulators on these topics, um, but from my understanding with conversations with other colleagues, I would kind of place them as a different type of bubble. They're not, they've got a lot of um, expertise and knowledge that maybe we, the experts don't, experts um, don't have uh, in terms of maybe how systems work, how, how you know, the regulatory aspects work. Um, so they'll know, they'll, they'll be carrying a body of knowledge that maybe we ourselves don't have. So A, I think it's really important to, to recognize, name and respect that and indicate like that you want to learn from them. Everyone likes to be thought of as important, like people, oh, I have knowledge and that, oh, I really want your knowledge. Please educate me, share, share with me. Like they want, they like to feel like that. So that's important, um, but I think they, they may be also public members. So maybe they don't have the training that we do. Maybe they don't have the deep knowledge. So before you decide maybe where to put them, what bucket to put them in, you do the same thing. You, you, you ask those probing questions to understand where they're at. Um, and that might help you a little bit in figuring out where to, how to engage with them. Very cool. Megan asks, I completely agree that having conversation and asking questions is really important for education. However, do you have any recommendations for situations when there can't be so much two-way conversations? For example, when creating online educational materials. That's a good idea. Uh, yeah, yeah um, 100%. Um, because yeah, sometimes you cannot, you can't like on the fly, you know, like, I'm wow, the brain just completely shut down. Um, you can't on the fly just pivot sometimes. There's going to be situations where you just have to create like a standalone module or a standalone whatever. Um, so, my recommendations would be first to un understanding and trying to learn who that target audience is going to be composed of um, and what types of kind of stakeholder groups are coming into that and will ultimately be receiving that. Uh, and then to the extent that you can, maybe there's previous information about what people that are like that, kind of where their barriers are, where their knowledge barriers are, where they're at, where their beliefs are. And so then you can maybe address that um, at the beginning of the module. Be like, you know, so this, this, this module is targeted to, you know, this, this, and this. Our learning objectives are this, this, and this. Um, so, 
we know from from the, of some others who are also in your same boat that these thoughts or these beliefs or these barriers are a challenge or are, are something that inform your work. Um, so, and then you address maybe some of that within it. So, so you're demonstrating what, I mean, that can be tricky because you don't, you have to be careful in being like, I'm assuming that you're this, right? Um, so acknowledging that there's some uncertainty there, but also trying to maybe do some of the work to, to, to figure out who your audience is for designing that module or that, you know, standalone thing where you're not going to be able to have a two-way conversation. Um, and then I think there's also, depending on what you're doing for an online module or a standalone training thing, there may still be spaces for you to um, help your audience, uh, whoever you're trying to train, um, do some independent learning and independent reflection maybe after the, this module. Uh, so this is something I do with my students. Um, some of the asynchronous kind of coursework that we have to do in the pandemic times means that I can't do a lot of back and forth with them. So instead what I do is I build out reflection questions and thought questions and kind of homework questions so that they, those folks can, you know, if they want, um, do some of that reflection in themselves, um, whether then I can, you know, if I have access to that, great. If I don't, then, you know, I just kind of have to hope for the best. Very cool. Laura asks, hi, Beth. I'm Laura Salazar, PhD student at Edinburgh University and SRUC. And I just wanted to say it was a really great talk, very refreshing and super useful. Do you have any books or papers that you could recommend to go deeper? Yes. And you know what I'll do is I will, um, I will send to Laura or Christian a, maybe a link to a Google folder uh, and I, where I will have thrown in some recommended sources, readings, et cetera. Uh, and then maybe you could share that on the Slack space and then everybody has access if they want. Yeah. Would it be okay if I post that when I post the video? Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Gail asks, what about the value of plain language for communications? Um, I think it, I, so, I mean, plain language versus like heavy jargon based um, language. I, I mean, I'm in, I'm in favor of that. Like, I, I think you have to be careful with dumbing down so much and assuming that, you know, like you have to be careful of not speaking down to folks. But I also think that anything that we communicate should be understandable to most anybody. Um, so if like, like there's, there's a lot of jargon in our field, it's fine to use it, but just clarify and define it. Don't just assume that people understand automatically what those, what those terms mean. I just provide the definition. Cool. Denyan asks, hi Beth, thanks for the great talk. Apologies that my connection was on and off and I may have missed this. I agree, it's indeed important to recognize the different knowledges from each stakeholder group. But how would you suggest when we're in situations when different ideas and knowledges are in conflict, do you have any advice on the strategies to resolve that? Thank you. Oh, yeah, that, I mean, that's something that I have to muddle through a lot. I, I run into that in my teaching often where I have, uh, you know, often I have, I have students who take you know, one of my classes and, and some of them may be, be co coming from like a really traditional livestock background um, where they have very discreet um, culturally and identity embedded ways in which they approach and envision animal welfare and how they define it. Uh, and that can be, that can look very, very different from my students who are coming in from maybe a political activism background or a liberation um, with a liberation twist. Um, maybe they're, you know, vegetarian or vegan or, you know, abolitionist in general. Um, and I have to, I have to ensure that like my students, A, don't kill each other, but I, I ultimately want them to learn from each other um, and to, to try to find where they can still, even though they might be so different and the views of the other are 
offensive even to them um, or, or, you know, even infringe on their identity, I have to still find a way for them to learn from each other, or at least if not learn from each other, um, you know, do basic respect for each other, perform basic respect for each other. Um, and I, that's not an easy thing. And I, I, I think it's very, very difficult for us to ha expect to be able to do that when we only have a group for a very short amount of time. Like if we're only in like an hour focus group or something or an, you know, a two hour workshop. Um, the, I, what I do when I have people longer than that, like in a, in a course, is I, I spend a lot of time at the beginning um, establishing why it's important that we listen to each other and why it's important um, that everyone's views are understood. And, I, and, and what I, my approach is that um, I tell my students, I tell others that I'm communicating with that they do not have to agree with me they do not have to agree with the other students in their class or the others in the group, um, but and they can and they can critique our ideas. What they cannot do and what we don't do, at least in, in our space, is is um, uh, disrespect each other and critique the people that maybe are carrying out the ideas. Um, so we can uh, critique the ideas, but not the people. Um, and I also. I share with them that every perspective that is brought in is a useful and a valuable one. And so setting the expectations that look like we may be different, but we each still have really interesting experiences that if we listen to each other a little bit, it might be uncomfortable and that's fine. It's actually good um, to be uh, uncomfortable, but um, see, like your job is to just see if you can understand the other person um, and really understand what they're saying. You don't have to like it, but you do need to understand it. And I usually find that when we do that, um, that can take an hour or two just to set kind of that framework. We have, we have a broad discussion about it usually. And then I might have to kind of revisit that throughout the class. If, you're, if you've got someone for an hour or two, I would still take the time to maybe like develop a kind of a an expectations or a grounding uh, framework for okay we're going to have this discussion this roundtable discussion for the next hour. I recognize that there's going to be you know people from over here and over here, um, but here are our expectations for how we're going to work today. And if everyone's still seated here, you're going to agree to abide by that. And I find that that usually heads off a lot of it. It's a, it's a good question. It's a hard question. Yeah. Well, thanks, Beth. It looks like that is all for the questions. So thank you so much again for your time and just for sharing, sharing your inspiring work. Uh, looking forward to seeing where you go in the future. And for everybody, this recording will be posted on Slack as well as YouTube for you to access later should you want. And so I'll stop recording now.